Pero yo de eso estoy agradecido. Porque la fealdad, como decía mi otro tío, Everardo López Sánchez, forja carácter. Mi padre pensó al verme que su verdadero hijo se lo había llevado la recién parida del cuarto de al lado. Trató por varios medios, chantaje, intimidación, burocracia, de devolverme a la enfermera que me entregó. Pero mamá me recibió en brazos desde que me vio rojo, hinchado y diminuto, estremeciéndome como almeja de agua clara en mi cobija de hospital. Mamá estaba entrenada para asumir la porquería como destino. Papá no. La enfermera le explicó a mis padres que mis cuatro dientes eran una condición rara en nuestro país, pero no poco común entre otras razas. Se llamaba dentición prenatal congénita. Y, por ejemplo, ¿qué razas? Preguntó mi padre a la defensiva. Concretamente los caucásicos, señor, dijo la enfermera. Pero si este niño es prieto como el petróleo, replicó él. La genética es una ciencia llena de dioses, señor Sánchez. Esto último debió consolar un poco a mi padre, que finalmente se resignó a llevarme en brazos hasta nuestra casa, envuelto como tamal en una cobija gruesa de franela sueca. Mamá lavaba ajeno. Papá no se lavaba solo ni las uñas. Las tenía recias, ásperas, negras. Se las cortaba con los dientes, no por ansioso, yo creo que por holgazán y prepotente. Mientras yo hacía la tarea en la mesa, él se las estudiaba en silencio frente al ventilador, tirado en el sillón de terciopelo verde que mamá heredó de Julio Cortázar, nuestro vecino del cuarto A, que murió de tétanos. Cuando los hijos del señor Cortázar vinieron a llevarse sus pertenencias, nos dejaron a su guacamaya, criterio, que a su vez murió de tristeza a las pocas semanas. Así como el sillón de terciopelo verde, donde papá se empezó a rellenar todas las tardes. Abismado, estudiaba las constelaciones de humedad en el cielo raso. Escuchaba radio educación y se arrancaba las uñas, dedo por dedo. Empezaba con la del meñique. Prensaba una esquina entre el diente incisivo central superior y el inferior, desprendía apenas una astilla y de un solo jalón tiraba la media luna de uña colgante que le sobraba. Después de arrancársela, la entretenía unos instantes en la boca. Hacía un taquito con la lengua y soplaba. La uña salía disparada y caía encima de mi cuaderno de tareas. Los perros ladraban afuera en la calle. Yo la miraba, muerta y mugrosa, a unos milímetros de la punta de mi lápiz. Entonces dibujaba un círculo alrededor de ella y seguía haciendo las planas, cuidando de no escribir encima del círculo que había trazado. Iban cayendo uñas del cielo sobre mi cuaderno escribe de raya ancha, como meteoritos propulsados por el aire del ventilador, anular, medio, índice y pulgar, y luego la otra mano. Yo iba acomodando las letras de la plana para rodear los pequeños cráteres circunferenciados que iban dejando sobre la página las inmundicias voladoras de papá. Cuando terminaba la plana, reunía las uñas en un cerrito y las guardaba en el bolsillo de mi pantalón. Luego, en mi cuarto, las metía en un sobre de papel que tenía debajo de mi almohada. Mi colección llegó a ser tan grande que a lo largo de mi infancia llené varios sobres fin de recuerdo. Beautiful. That was, uh, uh, so that's from the, the new novel, uh, La Historia de Mis Dientes, the, the Story of My Teeth. Um, I think when I hear the reactions of the people uh, here and also um, just when reading the novel, I had the impression that you must have had a lot of fun writing it. Yes, indeed. It was, it was um, a le less tortured process for me than, than usual. Um, It was, it was written in a very different way than my other novels. I usually um, have a very uh, m meticulous pr process in which I, I craft very small paragraphs and, and work on them and work on them almost as if they were uh, s sculptural pieces, no? where I, I take out a word, I put it back, and I, and I take a long time in, in with each little fragment that composes my work. And in this case, I was writing the novel 
in weekly installments for uh, the workers of a juice factory in Mexico. So um, basically, well, to explain the, the origin a bit, otherwise this just sounds completely crazy, and it's not. Um, there's a, there's a, well, reality is crazy. I, I'm not. No. So <laughs> okay. there is, there's a juice um, factory in Mexico that's called Humex, and this juice factory funds uh, a contemporary art collection. Mm -hmm. So this is a very important contemporary art collection. Um, that gets its money from um, selling juices, or gets its money to buy the art from selling juices. So I was asked to write a piece for a catalog of an exhibition that the Humix was putting together. And they asked me to write a, something in a blog. And I said, no, no, I don't, I don't do blogs. Um, I never had Tamagotchis. I, I don't know how to, how, to, how to feed something that has its own rhythm. Mm. So, um, so they said, OK. Um, but we wanted in installments. I don't know why they wanted in installments. I guess they wanted to make sure that I was working. And <laughs> so I said, OK, well, I'll do the installments. Mm -hmm. But why not uh, let me write the installments uh, not for the gallery, but for the workers in the factory? <laughs> and then they said, no, well, you're, that's, that's crazy. That's impossible. And then we, we had an, an exchange. And finally, they, they were convinced. And they, they were very enthusiastic and actually very helpful and made the whole logistics of this possible because they what I had to do was send a weekly installment mm -hmm. to um, the collection, and then they would print it in a sort of chapbook, cheap form, and they would distribute that among the factory workers. And eventually, a small reading group of factory workers was formed, and they, it was 12 of them, and they met each week to read the installment out loud, and then to discuss and often heavily criticize the installments, and then suggest their own solutions. <laughs> and so they, they were quite critical sometimes. Well, yeah, of course. Um, and I was writing under the pen name of Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez, because I knew that if I wrote in my uh, woman's name, uh, the reception in the factory would not be the same. Um, so they thought that I was writing my autobiography uh, as Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez, or to a certain degree, of course. It's obvious it's, it's exaggerated. Um, but so we had this on co coming and going of installments, and then they would d read, discuss, comment, tell their stories. All that was um, recorded in an MP3 audio file and sent back to me in New York, where I would hear their comments reading, and then I would write based on that the next installment. So it was a com and it was really S written very like much with them. Yes, it sounds like a great process, uh, like a great experiment. I yes, guess. yes, and it, it 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 implied a completely different rhythm of of writing, of course. Yes, yes. Yeah. that's great. Well, could you tell us a little more, maybe, about this Gustavo Sanchez? Sanchez. I mean, we've heard something about him. Um, what kind of man is he? What kind of character is he? Hmm. Well, so initially. To, to just be able to jump into the text, I, I was thinking mm -hmm. of um, the voice of my, of my uncle, who's um, a dubious salesman in a, <laughs> in a big market in Mexico City uh, called the Central de Bastos, mm -hmm. where he trades like car parts for like, TVs and TVs for uh, Spanish ham. And like, it's a whole sort just of anything, economy of anything. trade. And yeah. And it, he's, of course, as he's a salesman, he has this incredible, uh, very sort of streetwise and uh, charming way to sell his products and tell his stories. And he tells it. So I thought of him initially when I, when I started writing about, um, or from the voice of Gustavo Sanchez, Sanchez Carretera. And on the other hand, um, I started hearing one of the voices of the one of the workers that I was immediately fascinated by, and I kind of started appropriating his constructions, his his intonations. Mm -hmm. So it it became a mixture of one of the workers and my my uncle. Now the the narrator is um is originally a, a policeman in a juice factory, who who then becomes uh, an auctioneer mm -hmm. who, start, uh, who tells stories about the, the... Yes, because 
of the objects that he auctioning sells. Auctioning doesn't seem to be for him as much about selling things, but more about the stories, about making up stories. Yes, of course. Well, he 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 has a, a very. Uh, mediocre repertoire of story of mm. not stories of, 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 of objects, objects for yes. which he then has to uh, make up uh, a series of stories in order to be able to endow these objects with certain meaning and that's precisely the the kind of direction that the um, discussion between the workers always took mm. in terms of what was being exhibited in the um, gallery next to the factory. Mm -hmm. Like the, the discussion always went back to, well, OK, we're here doing this project, and then we're supposed to be talking and maybe writing about these contemporary art pieces, which are, for example, a desiccated dog, or uh, a mountain of clay resembling a mountain of shit, or um, a bonsai of a like all these contemporary art objects, which which one always asks, well, okay, where does the value of this come mm. from? And it's not as much about the objects as about the stories that uh, about the narrative or uh, the yeah, procedure yeah. that that mm. made them. And, and um, so, but they were always very critical about the value of of these objects, mm -hmm. and and their their narrative around them was that it was precisely a, a blowing up of value mm. through narrative so the, the 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 what i wrote is very much um a kind of allegory of that same procedure mm -hmm. am i right to see gustavo sanchez sanchez highway uh, um, uh, am i right to see him as to to see the process of how he develops from this uh, from this guard or policeman to being an auctioneer to see it as some kind of um, uh, um, a, a, a growth towards becoming an artist that he becomes an artist that i read it as almost a building school man yeah. so to say yeah well kind of it's like the the the, the anti or the, the sat sat satirical side of the building mm. man in the sense that uh, in fact he 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 becomes something or someone but but in becoming uh, he he really does become nothing more than than a kind of self salesman no? which is very much what the uh, writing industry and the art industry is about uh, <laughs> uh, c creating uh, a kind of public figure that is able to to mm. fundamentally sell him or herself in order to then sell his or her products mm. yes and what about the teeth then why 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 the teeth what is the what did the it's i haven't read many novels about teeth <laughs> Well, there's a, the Martin Amis confession of his teeth, right? Oh, and I there's a I few. Read that one. Um, well, you'll be surprised how many teeth things <laughs> there are in literature. Okay. It's obviously, I mean, my, my own take on teeth is well, um, I have terrible teeth. Um, they're always full of holes and cavities, and I suffer a lot, and I'm always in the dentist, and it's all so expensive to pay. It's, I, I think if, if you're middle class, and you dedicate yourself to writing, you are uh, condemned to just uh, uh, decay uh, in a very d horrible way. <laughs> and, and it's very difficult to, to help yourself. Um, so, and I think that writers, many writers, not all of course, will b belong to, to this kind of middle class that um, that that is always yeah with bad with terrible teeth and other terrible things where I won't mention in stage but <laughs> that is always kind of um, aspiring or playing at belonging to some kind of elite or jet set but in fact the 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 real the re the real life of the writer is is much less glamorous than 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 all that and uh that reality is in front of him uh, every time he smiles at himself if he dares to uh, and sees his teeth in the mirror um so there there's 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 that tension no um of 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 writers or artists as sort of social climbers that have all, uh, these teeth that f fundamentally betray um, yes. all those yes. aspirations. I find it difficult to understand because personally I have a very glamorous I life. can see, and I see you have beautiful, <laughs> beautiful teeth. <laughs> They're so white. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> but you're, uh, you, yeah. There's a you, you, maybe in Europe you you have a medical insurance and yes, that's yes. <laughs> that's a very different situation. Yes, yes, but yes, but maybe that's 
switch to another topic. Okay, another topic. I mean, we can, we can carry on yeah, with this topic. I don't, I don't so, no, th there's one more thing that, that I was fascinated by. Uh, when you read the excerpt, um, I, I heard the name of Julio Cortázar, yeah. who is a character in the, in the, in the, um, in the book. Uh, but of course, Julio Cortázar is also a very famous Argentinian writer. Mm. Um, South and American. It, South American, case. certainly. He's certainly <laughs> South American. Well, not really. He, he lived in Paris his whole life. Well, he's he actually had, from Brussels. Yes, he's and he was born in Brussels. Born in Brussels. And he, yeah. and he spoke he spoke Spanish with a French accent. Yeah, he ha I think he had a problem with, um, with his tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it really was not an accent. It was, a, it was a, something in the tongue. Something in the yeah. tongue, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Good, well, um, but Julio Cortázar is also a character in the, in, in the book, and, and there are many more. All kinds of the book is filled with, with names, mm -hmm. all the names of the... Of the of, of famous writers, famous philosophers, and so on. So um, uh, there's Ruben Darío, there is uh, whatever. There's a Borges, there is. They're all in there. Uh, even you uh, come in the, yeah. in the in the novel at some point. Um, being Not a famous next writer, Borges, no, but, yes. but yeah, I'm there <laughs> so, too. Yeah. So, uh, but um, uh, what is the what he has, is the idea behind this? Because also um, in the in the in the motto, for example, you also refer to the link between words and um, between language, between words and names mm. and, and objects. So what is the, mm. the idea behind mm -hmm. this? Well, yeah, the, can you still hear me? The idea behind this was to, to emulate, um, oh sorry, so I was talking earlier on about how, how with the workers, one of the discussions was well, what is the ultimate value of these pieces in this gallery and kind of what, what would happen if you, if, you, if, you take, if you do the reverse Duchampian procedure of instead of bringing in an object that doesn't have artistic value and putting it in a gallery context and therefore endowing it with value, what happens when you do the opposite? No? Taking uh, an art object uh, outside the gallery space and, and, and then re-examining its value outside the context that, that gives it its aura. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I didn't want to just reproduce that in, or talk about that in the novel. I, I, I wanted to play with that on, on in, in my own field or in, yeah, in my own playing field, which is, is, is literature. So I, what I did with those names was kind of use l a writer's names as if they were objects um, mm -hmm. and kind of empty them out of their context content so that Julio Cortázar is not Julio Cortázar the writer, but just someone's neighbor. Um, or um, Borges is a, a truck driver, um, or um, I mean, there's a, a long yes. series of writers. Mm -hmm. So they're all kind of uh, emptied out of, of their identities and displaced outside their zone of the, what what gives sort of the, their 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 aura or their meaning, and then just placed outside, and it's it's sort of a, w a way to play with these parallels between the art objects and and the figure of the writer as mm. well. Yes, it's. Um this also the the not just the names but also the the, the fact of the the language the way we use language um, is also one of the main aspects I think that you write about that is one of your light motives in in, in your writing mm -hmm. I think I remember from uh, your book of essays from um, sidewalks there is a there is a place where you say that when a child um, starts to speak that it is um, it is not it doesn't discover language or something like that but that it is banned from language. Mm. Did I say that? Yes, I, so let me check. Um, <laughs> yes, I think you're referring to an essay in, in Papeles Falsos, in, yes, in yes, uh, yes, Falso Papier, Papier. Yes. Um, where, yeah, well, where I, I, I conceive the process of learning a language not so much as a process of becoming acquainted with the mm. world, but becoming estranged from it. Yes. Um, and I mean, I, I see that very much with my, my own kid who's growing up bilingual um, and how, how f for her um, learning at, at some point when she realized that there, were more than, there was more than one word for a table, there was a moment of shock or any object, no? Like, how, th how can this not be what this is? This is also this other and this other thing, and therefore, like, what, um, mm. there, I think that cre creates a kind of decalage or d distance from, mm -hmm. yes. from a relation uh, to reality. Uh, however, I must say, I'm not a psychologist and I'm not a linguist, so um, I'm very much in, in, in the field of, um, 
of literary speculation, which has no scientific value. Yes, of course. Okay. Yes, yes. Just <laughs> want to be clear. Okay. It's, it's okay. Yes, <laughs> I, I kind of, okay. uh, kind of got that. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but, but, but I'm also referring to this because I want to talk a little about um, uh, about faces in the crowd, uh, and there, of course, you also have this uh, this 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 kid, uh, um, the middle, the, the second kid, or the the, the well, how the is middle it translated? Kid. Um, it's middle to kind, so it is. Mm -hmm. Translated this, uh, and it's it actually um, the, he's the oldest, you know. But um, yeah. but there are only there are two, and as he doesn't want to be the oldest, they make him uh, they, the middle they, boy. Yes, well, el niño mediano boy. in yes. in okay. Spanish. Yeah. So uh, and he also um, um, he comes in in this in this book, uh, which consists of very short fragments, which is a very different book uh, from uh, the story of my teeth in its yeah. style and everything. A very different book. Um, he always comes in and and kind of plays with language, uh, kind of uses it, abuses it, mm. um, which I thought was very fascinating because I also have a son who is too and who does exactly the same, of course. Yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, I have a, ste a stepson who's now mm. nine, but at that time he was six or five and I just steal all his words and his fascinating ways of constructing um, ideas. And... Um, and had a lot of conversations with him while I was writing that book. But um, the way I think, I mean, what I write is fiction. I don't, I, I, I bring in the sounds mm -hmm. and of my surroundings always. No, I, I like my, my work to kind of bear the, the imprint of, of its process of its making. And therefore, it's always full of kind of, of, of those fingerprints of whatever is happening around me while I'm working. So if, if I would hear a conversation, um, that uh, the children were having, I would bring it in, or um, or the noise outside and the neighbors, and what what happens then in the page is that is is, is that fiction is constructed that had no, nothing has nothing to do with with really what what is going on around you, and the the role that this um, character of the middle boy or the medium boy plays in the book is 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 kind of like that of the the oracle in Greek tragedies. That is, he, he, he with languages, kind of foresh foreshadows what, what might happen. And then what does happen is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy in the book. So he's kind of the, the generator of fiction in the book um, that allows then the, the, the narrator to, to construct through his words what might happen. And that kind of ends up happening, as it often does with fiction. Mm, yes. Um, y yes, also one of the elements that is very present in the, um, uh, Faces in the Crowd, which is also very, a wonderful, uh, wonderful book, uh, one of the things is that um, reality and fiction become mixed up, that mm -hmm. fiction enters reality. And um, uh, because it's, it's about, a, about a writer, one of the characters, about many things, of course, you can, you can not really say that it has a straightforward plot. But one of the things is, is of course, this, uh, there's a female uh, writer who has two children and she, she, wants to, she wants to write a book and she starts writing a book about, uh, um, about uh, uh, Gilbert, uh, Gilberto Owen, who is, uh, uh, who is um, a, a Mexican writer who has lived in Harlem uh, of, the, um, of, the, of the first half of the 20th century uh, and then it turns out that he is also writing a book about her you know so and um, I found it very fascinating how fiction seems to fiction and reality how the two become intertwined hmm. yeah in, in very in very many ways um, faces in the crowd or um, Die Schwerelosen, or how would you pronounce it here? The the uh, the Gewichtlosen, the Schwerelosen. Uh, that's German. the German. Version. So the Gewichtlosen, or um, <laughs> or uh, Los Ingravidos in Spanish, is is very much a, a defense of fiction in the sense that it's a book about how fiction does modify our daily lives and how it does. And not necessarily for the better. How how it can create tension in a family. How it can um, create um, a dismemberment of a relationship, or how it can come and just really in inhabit the space that that we live. So in in that sense, it's a defense of fiction. Uh, hi fiction is not innocuous. Fiction is not just something that lives out there and that we sometimes reach into uh, in order to be entertained, that's perfectly um, all right, and it does happen too, but, but there is a way that in which fiction does transform the way we, 
we live our lives. It does mediate our relationship to space and to people and is therefore never innocuous. There, there, is, no, um, there is no innocence in fiction. Mm. Yes, yes. Yes, there is no innocence in fiction. In absolutely. general. I totally, <laughs> I totally agree. I couldn't agree more. Um, so, um, um, which uh, um, one of the things that I also found interesting if I compare the two novels mm. is the, the, uh, the fact that um, the two main characters are, um, are, are great liars. Um, they, um, uh, they are great liars. They, um, they just, uh, at one point, for example, in, the, um, in Faces in the Crowd, the, main, the, 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 the lady says, at that point I start lying and then in the um, in the story of my teeth um, uh, the main Gustavo Sanchez Sanchez also um, makes up stories he starts uh, he starts lying what is the sense of this uh, um, what is the or it's not maybe not just lying maybe it's just coming further beyond just the truth the factual truth but mm. what is the sense of this what can you reach with this well I mean I think I mean I don't lie and um, Good for you. therefore, I, I play with, with, with that in my, in my books. Now, I mean, I, I don't think that lying is the, is, the, is the exact term for it. I think that, of course, there's, there's an element of, of con artists or of a ruse in, um, in many of the characters that I write about. But, but I think that, I, c I mean, I conceive f fiction and as, as, as a a mode of f fabrication, and in, in that sense, well, of course, um, the the, ca the characters that I work with are always p playing within the limits of of fabrication and an everydayness, or of or of retelling their everydayness and then fa fabricating from it. And it's very much my own my own procedure. But I mean, I'm, I'm interested more in the. Um, in the way that fiction comes into our lives and the way that it transforms our self-narratives than in lying itself. Although I do find um, sort of con, con artist-like characters rather charming. <laughs> yes. Um, would you, could you say um, in, in uh, Papalus Falsus, in um, so what was the English sidewalks, you also have, a, uh, have an essay about maps, mm -hmm. um, and, um, uh, which is a great, a great essay. Uh, and could you compare fiction to uh, a, a map that you, that you try to construct of reality? Do, does it work that way? Or is it more a way to, I don't know, maybe it's just a way to get lost in reality? I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on this? I, I I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if, if, if literature works like a map, mm -hmm. you mean? Is it a way to, 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 to construe a map, for example? Because also, um, also if I read from your, um, for, for, uh, if I, when I read your biography, you started writing uh, Faces in the Crowd when you, you uh, came to live in Harlem, mm -hmm. I think, in, um, in, in New York City, which is, uh, uh, and I guess it's also a way to kind of get to know the place and to, to construct your own layer of the city, mm -hmm. your own personal city, you might say. Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in, in, in maps and, I mean, the, the, the metaphor of literature as map, I mean, I think, of course, it can be a metaphor that applies in, in the sense that map mapping is a way of, of grouping things together and uh, including and excluding and, and demarcating territories, um, be they linguistic or, or, or real, factual. Um, so yes, I guess th the metaphor you're asking about works. But I, I am particularly interested in maps and in, in mapping the spaces to which I come to live. And I... I do so because it's. Um, I have. I have always lived in different territories and have, have kind of had to, um, in in a rather artificial way, make those spaces my own. And when I say artificial, I mean um, again fiction and fabrication. I, the the way that I feel that I uh, started inhabiting Mexico City and not only Mexico City but my own language. Uh, Spanish was through writing my first book and writing a first book about Mexico City or a failed book about Mexico City because Papeles Falsos is not a book about Mexico City. It's about the impossible the impossibility of writing about yes. that city and the many points of view um, through which I try to write about it and don't really arrive at it ever. Um, and in 
I guess in, in the essays that I'm writing now, I'm writing more essays in English now. I'm I'm also charting a map of my of my own neighborhood now, and it's and especially the the, the Mexicans in Harlem, which are. Um, a rather invisible population because of their um, nature or the, 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 the simple fact that they are I illegal migrants and, and are uh, preferred to be unheard and unseen, um, but also have fascinating stories to tell and, and are not represented in any kind of cultural map uh, of, of that area or that neighborhood. Yeah. Do you, because you write, sometimes you, you write in Spanish, sometimes you write in English, you write in, in more than one language, don't you? Not at the same time, as we said, but, uh, but you write in more than that one language. Uh, does that make a difference? Uh, I don't know, I couldn't think of, of, of writing in another language than, than, than Dutch. Um, so the fact that you write in several languages, what is the effect of this? And, and, and when you then translate from one language to another, or when you compare, uh, what is the effect of this? Well, the, the effect is that it, I, it's it's all very messy and confusing for me for a long time, mm -hmm. and that it, it, I also uh, waste an incredible amount of time in going from one language to the other while I'm or or in reworking one of the languages. Um, to whichever the work has been translated, because I always rewrite on top of the translations. But it also implies that um, after I've finally chosen a language to use for a specific piece, and usually it's the, the nature of the piece itself which dictates the language that I have to use for it. Um, but once I've made the decision and have gone and followed through and finished, um, and I then read the translator's version. I never self-translate exactly mm -hmm. because it's it's the most boring thing that you can do. Yes. I mean, if you've already written a book, uh, you're going to write it again? No. And <laughs> also, the only nice thing about writing is the freedom you have yes. in writing. And retranslating yourself is like everything that's bad about writing and not about good, yes, not, nothing good. Mm -hmm. However, I do rework the translations. And in doing so, I, I'm able to see a lot of, the, of my own bullshit. Um, so there is a lot of things that, like in Spanish, work because they are rhetorical. Spanish is a language that, that lends itself to, to a certain, certain baroquism um, or, where certain, um, or where I can get more carried away because I'm more playful with it maybe with certain sounds and repetitions. And then when I see them in English, I realize that it's utter bullshit and I have to, to rethink about it. And so that duplicity makes, makes me f sort of filter, filter, filter my work and, and make it as, as spare as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, could you, it's, uh, I think we'll have to conclude more or less. Uh, I think Ewan McEwen is up next, so we have to run yes, out. Yes, so we have to. <laughs> Leave him the we, space. We more or less have to conclude. Let me check we have, well, we have one, half a minute. That oh, well, yeah. Little. Um, <laughs> I so, think we can and, go. <laughs> and they told us that we should really stop on time. So, uh, muchas gracias. Thank you a lot for, uh, uh, for, coming, for coming here. And um, um, don't immediately run away. So, because um, the uh, these wonderful books that um, uh, Valeria has uh, written can also be bought, and she's also going to sign them. So um, you can go to the shop, and I would advise you to buy these two books. Uh, um, and then the other one, of course, is, is not available, but I would then advise you to um, read these two, and then afterwards also run to the bookshop uh, in a month, and then buy the other book uh, as well. So thanks a lot for Thank being here. Thank you very much.